Historically, soft tissue defects around the lower leg, ankle, and hind foot have required free flap coverage due to the limitations of the common proximally based pedicle flaps of the lower extremity. The reverse sural neurovascular pedicle flap has gained popularity as an alternative to free flaps for coverage of distal leg wounds because it is based off of a consistent distal perforator and can be performed without microvascular techniques. The reverse sural flap is a good option for skin defects around the distal leg, but muscle tissue remains preferable for cases involving osteomyelitis, infection, or acute fractures that benefit from the robust vascular environment of muscular tissue. The distally based peroneus brevis muscle flap is based off of the same set of perforating vessels as the reverse sural fasciocutaneous flap, but may be preferred for the reasons stated above. Exposure, harvest, and transposition of the distally based peroneus brevis muscle flap does not require microvascular techniques and can be successfully performed by most orthopedic surgeons. Anatomy of the peroneus brevis muscle flap. Peroneus brevis is one of two muscles in the lateral compartment of the leg. It sits deep or medial to the peroneus longus, and its primary function is to evert and pronate the foot. It originates from the lateral aspect of the proximal fibula and inserts into the base of the fifth metatarsal. Its total size is estimated to be around 28 centimeters in length and 3 centimeters wide at the middle portion of the muscle. Its tendon then continues posterior to the fibula, sharing a sheath with the tendon of the peroneal longus. Innervation is by the superficial peroneal nerve with a consistent proximal motor branch that originates from the nerve as it runs between the two peroneus muscles. Its vascular supply consistently originates from several sources, which is one of the features that allows it to be used as a muscle flap. Its primary blood supply is from the peroneal artery, which most often stems from the tibio-peroneal trunk and then runs distally in the superficial posterior compartment of the leg, just medial to the fibula. It then offers multiple arterial pedicles, between four to six, to the muscle at various levels. The most proximal arterial pedicle consistently enters the muscle approximately between 11 and 18 centimeters from the tip of the fibula and can be used to create a proximally pedicled muscle flap. The final branch is more consistent in its course and typically ends in an anastomotic connection to the posterior tibial artery, together supplying the distal muscle at a distance 4 to 6 centimeters proximal to the tip of the fibula. This is the key arterial branch which must be preserved and is what provides retrograde flow to perfuse the muscle when used as a distally pedicled muscle flap. Indications. The distally based peroneus brevis muscle flap can cover small to moderate sized soft tissue defects around the medial and lateral malleoli, anterior ankle, Achilles tendon, and calcaneus. The patient must have adequate peripheral vascular supply and dopplerable peroneal perforators. Prior incisions or surgeries in this region warrant a more detailed assessment. Surgical technique. The patient is usually positioned supine with a bump under the ipsilateral hip. A sandbag may be taped to the OR table to allow the knee to be flexed approximately 60 degrees and prevent the foot from sliding during elevation and transposition of the peroneus brevis and placement around the foot and ankle. In this particular case, with a lateral ankle wound, we facilitated the vascular mapping, exposure, transposition, and insetting of the distally based peroneus brevis flap by positioning the patient laterally supported by a beanbag and foam leg tunnel to support the injured extremity. We give prophylactic antibiotics and prep the right lower extremity with chlorhexidine. A timeout is completed before making the incision. A few days prior to surgery, we confirm the presence of at least two intact vascular pedicles to the distal peroneus brevis. Therefore, we do our final vascular mapping after the patient's right extremity was prepped and draped. Using a Doppler probe, we identify the most distal perforator from the perineal system and mark this with a pin. The perforator is consistently located 4 to 6 centimeters proximal to the tip of the distal fibula or approximately 3 finger breasts from the distal tip of the fibula. We try to identify as many perforators as possible moving proximally along the leg. In this case, we were able to clearly identify two, maybe three, clear perforators using the Doppler probe. We draw a line centered on the fibula and running the entire length of the fibula, 
and directly into the soft tissue defect for complete harvest and anticipated insetting of the perineal brevis. Local anesthetic is injected using 0.25% bupivacaine along this line. We placed a sterile tourniquet around the thigh and inflate it to 250 millimeters of mercury and then perform an extensive irrigation and debridement of the recipient site, carefully debriding all remaining non-viable tissues. We send tissue cultures to rule out infection and help guide potential antibiotic treatment. Once the recipient site is thoroughly irrigated and debrided, the skin and subcutaneous fat is incised carefully down to the fascia overlying the lateral compartment of the leg. Soft tissue tension with gentle retraction of the skin edges facilitates exposure of the lateral compartment fascia without inadvertently going too deep and entering the lateral compartment. We are careful not to disrupt the deep tissues posterior to the peroneus brevis within six centimeters of the tip of the distal fibula. We gently place self-retaining retractors to hold the skin flaps apart. We then carefully incise the fascia over the lateral compartment exposing the peroneus longus muscle and the superficial peroneal nerve running along the anterior portion of the lateral compartment. In the lower third of the incision, we are careful to identify and preserve the superficial peroneal nerve as it exits the fascia of the lateral compartment. We separate the peroneus longus from the underlying peroneus brevis with a combination of blunt and sharp dissection as needed. We can easily distinguish the two muscles distally in the more tenderness portions. Once the two muscles are identified, they separate fairly easily. At the proximal end of the lateral compartment, we identify the motor branch to the peroneus brevis as it branches off of the common peroneal nerve. We section the motor branch being careful not to injure the superficial perineal nerve. Once the nerve is sectioned, the superficial perineal branch is freed and protected as it runs anteriorly in the lateral compartment. The perineal brevis is then sharply elevated from the lateral border of the fibula from proximal to distal. As small perforators are encountered during the elevation of the muscle, they are cauterized or ligated. As few perforators as possible are ligated to allow mobilization of the peroneus brevis as needed depending on the distance to and location of the recipient site. In most cases, only the most distal one or two perforators are preserved to allow enough mobilization of the muscle to reach defects around the foot and ankle, especially the medial side of the ankle. Once we reach the desired length of the flap, we check and confirm that the remaining vascular pedicle is intact and patent using the Doppler. Careful exposure of the consistent distal perforator can be done to visualize it but at some risk of injuring it and its supporting structures and tissue. Simple Doppler confirmation is all that is necessary to confirm a patent perforator. We rotate the freed peroneus brevis flap into the recipient site. Because the most proximal tip of the flap will be the least viable, we debride the tip of the flap, but careful to leave enough of the flap to fully cover the recipient site. We place a mattress pull-through stitch with a nylon suture to anchor the flap into the recipient site and then gently spread the muscle fibers of the flap as needed to cover the intended area. We secure the edges of the flap with 3O or 4O monofilament absorbable sutures to the surrounding edges of the recipient site with as little tension as possible. We let down the tourniquet to observe the viability of the flap and confirm that it bleeds. We place a small drain in the donor site cavity and close the donor site in layers. We then harvest a split thickness skin graft from the ipsilateral thigh at 12 thousandths of an inch thickness and then mesh it at a ratio of one to one and a half. We soak a sponge in quarter percent bupivacaine and epinephrine and cover the donor site. The split thickness skin graft is then attached along its periphery with surgical clips, avoiding staples directly on the muscle flap where possible. We use a 4-0 chromic or monofilament resorbable suture to attach the skin graft if crevices or small depressions exist in the interior of the graft. We cover the recipient site with a silicone perforated sheeting, Mepilex, and then a bulky bolster dressing to stabilize the graft. The donor site is dressed with a zeroform sheet covered with opsite. We place the foot and ankle into a prefo that has a kickstand to keep the lower extremity from externally rotating, assuring no external pressure on the flap. After five days, we remove the dressings from the graft and redress it with silicone perforated sheeting or xeriform and another soft dressing. We inspect the graft weekly until epithelialized. Weight bearing is restricted to prevent disruption of the graft for a minimum of two weeks, 
or until the surgeon feels the graft is alive and the wound can tolerate motion and shear.